Good evening. Thank you all for joining us for tonight's SIF 45 Streams Happy Hour, which is sponsored by Great Lakes Brewing Company. My name is Allie Freeman, and I'm the Development Manager for the Cleveland International Film Festival. Our friends at Great Lakes Brewing Company encourage you to put your phone down during this happy hour and consider it replacing it with a fresh Great Lakes beer. I'd like to introduce Kelly Parker from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center who will be interpreting for us during the first half of our program tonight. Thank you for being here, Kelly. Uh, be sure to check out the latest updates on the SIF website for the most up-to-date info on film availability and make sure to prioritize those films you really wanna see by watching them first. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be celebrating our 45th birthday, so be sure to follow us on social and attend tomorrow's happy hour for some special prizes and giveaways. Now, each night of the festival, our filmmakers and guests answer your questions about their films. If you're watching live and you would like to ask a question, just use the YouTube chat feature over on the right-hand side. Our moderators will ask selected questions to the filmmakers and guests. On tonight's happy hour, we'll be joined by guests from feature films, including Meet the Future and Youth v. Gov. Now, both of these films are directed by women, and in an industry that has been historically dominated by men, the CIFF is honored to showcase these films directed by women who make up 49% of our feature filmmakers. So now we're gonna get started with our first segment, which will be led by SIF Programming Manager, Danielle Davis. Hi, thank you, Allie, so much. As Allie said, I'm Danielle, also known as Danny Davis, uh, the Programming Manager of the Cleveland International Film Festival. I'm so happy to be here tonight, but I wish, obviously most of us wish we could see you guys in person instead of like this, but at least you get to see our faces some, somehow. Um, so tonight, I'm going to bring you our first segment, our first Q&A of the night. It's Meet the Future. I'm super happy to introduce to you guys writer, director, producer of the film, Liz Marshall. And Liz, it's so great to have you back. She's actually a SIF alumni. She brought The Ghost in Our Machine back in 2013. So hopefully she'll have another film coming out soon so we can invite her back to our physical festival and we do that again. And joining Liz and I is David Kay, the Director of Communications for Memphis Meets, who the company who was uh, featured in the film. So great, so great to have you guys here. Great to be here. Hi, Danny. Hi, David. Yeah, so great to be here. Thanks so much for, for including us and excited for a good discussion. Yes, good. So I have to say, I have to admit that films revolving around industrial farming and factory farming, usually at least for me, are so intimidating because most of the time you just picture the brutality of, of what all of that entails. And Liz, I just have to say that I loved the balance that you provided in this film. And, you know, and I feel like the title to the play on words, Meet the Future, M-E-A-T, not M-E-E-T, goes hand in hand with, with not, I wouldn't say the, the light, the lightness of the film, but like this polite persuasiveness that you had, you know, you introduced the film with just enough of that tugging at our heartstrings, like, Hey, look, there's a problem here, you know, in the way that we produce meat and the way that our factory farms are run and industrialization of farming in general. But you, I did not feel overwhelmed at all. But again, like I said, you were straight to the point, like, look, this is a problem. This is what's going on. But, and you brought this solution forward when you introduced Memphis meats. And I just, I thought it was beautiful. And I would love to know how you came to find that balance of not of not bringing the viewer down and making it super depressing which i think happens a lot with films that deal with such socially conscious uh films that you know you're trying to bring an audience you're trying to bring viewers you're trying to motivate them uh to a call of action 
but I wanted to know how you found that balance in not making it so heavy. Great. I'm glad that, you know, I'd like to focus on that. I think that's a great question to begin. Um, solution focused themes. I feel that there's a wave happening right now, and this is part of that wave um, that is essential. We need more narratives out there, whether it's uh, documentary or fiction, whatever it may be, we need solutions yes. and we need them urgently. And, you know, the subject of industrial animal agriculture is harrowing. Its impact on the planet, on health, on animals, all of it is an emergency and we need viable solutions. And I wanted to make a film and really sort of commit myself early on to following a story that had that possibility uh, and was an opportunity, like an entry point, a window into something that uh, was exciting and that we could follow over time. So we started filming in 2016 when Memphis Meets was a teeny tiny little company and David is in that first scene. Um, and we, we had the privilege of being able to be behind the scenes over three and a half years and follow essentially the birth of an industry. Mm -hmm. So it's referred to as cell-based meat, as cultivated meat, as cultured meat, uh, the nomenclature is really interesting, but um, to give it a shorthand, it's cell-based meat. And, you know, it was, uh, and maybe uh, I'll just crack a little joke, which is that I'm Canadian. And you're right, there is a politeness to the, the film. Um, <laughs> but, but that's also, I think, um, you know, measured with uh, not wanting to traumatize people or smash people over the head. But I do think that um, you know, the underpinnings, the social underpinnings. So from an environmental climate emergency perspective, from a human health perspective, from an animal welfare, animal rights perspective, all of these underpinnings, I think, um, and, and, and what has been fed back to us in terms of, you know, uh, critics and audiences is that that gravity is definitely there. It's inherent in the story as you you know move forward scene by scene. Um, but there are enough films out there that focus on the dramatic impacts yeah. in a way that make you weep, make you you know rage. But again, like just to you know complete the answer to your question, um, it's really about an active viable solution and it's through the entry point of one startup company that is representative of the birth of an industry globally i i just think that is so beautiful you know because like you said you you don't want to smash people over the head i i think there's been a lot of films in the past that there's so much horrific imagery that like we we get it like we know that these things are happening and the, the people that do care really do care, but they want to be informed without seeing that, you know, too much of that. And I just think you had such a great balance of it. But at the same time, I think finding Memphis Meets and more specifically, Dr. Uma Valetti was such a treat, was such a treat mm -hmm. because Memphis Meets throughout the entire film, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how just terrific, how, uh, I don't even know the words, just how amazing Dr. Uma is. He's so positive with his team, with his approach, with life. And I feel like your editing style and the way that you approached it and the way that you developed the story was just, it just went so hand in hand with Memphis Beans. Mm. And it was also so, I feel like the subject matter was so huge, but it was so character driven at the same time. Yes. And I feel like that made a huge difference. You know, okay. like here's this mm. guy and, you know, at one point during the story, he tells us like, you know, this is, I witnessed this as a, as a child at a birthday party. I witnessed something so amazing and then something so horrific and tragic. 
and his story. And although that's horrific, he tells this story in a way that we grab onto, but then he, he, it's something so horrific and he, but just his positive attitude is so amazing. And I would actually, I would love to ask you, David, what it's like right now in 2021 working alongside Dr. Uma and, you know, how he impacts the team as a leader. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, some of the answer you've already hit on in some of your questions and, and Liz already talked about, and that is that uh, he is, he has structured the company as a very solutions oriented company. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot, which is uh, in the film, is this big tent mentality. And that is this vision that cell cultured meat can be a solution that many different types of stakeholders can get behind. Uh, and so that includes, you know, investors like meat companies like Cargill and Tyson Foods. On the other hand, it also includes environmental impact uh, oriented individuals like Bill Gates and Richard Branson, uh, people who are in it for to, to protect animals. Um, and that is really the, you know, one of the, the core visions behind Memphis Meats. You know, how can we make this a solution that people can get behind mm -hmm. um, no matter where they're coming from or, you know, what particular issue related to food they are most passionate about. And I think Uma really recognizes that um, and understands that that is a, a really important part of our of our DNA as a company. I think the other thing I would just say is I think Liz did an incredible job of showing not just the what and the how and the why of of Memphis Meats, but also the who. Uh, and this goes to your question, Danielle, of how inspiring it is to work, and not just with Uma, certainly with him, um, but also with all the other coworkers and colleagues at Memphis Meats. Uh, so many talented people who get out of bed every day and want to make a positive impact on the world. And to be able to share the who behind the mission um, I think it, it's been such a, a privilege to be able to see that reflected in the film and captured so beautifully by Liz. Um, so I think that for me, that's one of that's one of the parts of Meet the Future that that I am most uh, enthusiastic about. I I love that you brought up you know like your colleagues and everybody else that works with you and and Dr. Uma. I it you know something that really stuck with me from the film was you know when you took bits and pieces of the different scientists or everybody that was coming together to make Memphis Meets work, you know, around that um, conference table. And it was, why are you here? How did you get here? What inspires you to be here? And I just thought that was so beautiful. The passion of this project and the mission, I feel like just gives Memphis Meets this whole different opportunity that and different feel that say uh, another meat company doesn't have. It doesn't have that, that what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't have- Humanity. That, yes, it doesn't. And that's another thing that Dr. Uma really brings to it. It's like, it brings a sense of humanity to the subject, but it really, it just, it helps propel you guys forward. It, you guys are all there out of passion. You believe in this mission, you know, and Liz, I think you did such a beautiful job just kind of shooting around that table and, and letting everybody express why they were there. And, you know, and actually that leads me to my next question, Liz, I, you know, I, of course I Googled you and came across your own website and I had realized just under your bio, there was these two pieces of paper from when you were a kid, it was May of 1977, I believe, you wrote to the prime minister asking him to help poor people and stop war. And I, I just, of course, I wanted to ask, like, how did you get here? And, and what drove you to make such films? You know, and of course, obviously, just seeing that you've, you've been passionate about helping you know, not just yourself, but those around you and, and now the world, you know, and spreading this message. So what do you think was it as a child that gave you that awareness of caring for 
people around you and the environment around you? So it was definitely fostered in the home setting, you know, like in the, in my home and my mother definitely is someone who, you know, she's been a psychotherapist for, you know, her, you know, 45 years, but she just retired, but um, she's an activist. She awesome. deeply cares about social justice and the environment and animals. And she's been my greatest supporter all through the years. So I, I would, it would be a miss. I would, I have to call out Diane Marshall because she's just such a wonderful um, role model in that way. And she's always been so dedicated. So I think, you know, if you're nur nourished, nurtured, if it's fostered in your upbringing as part of your moral compass, to think outside your own bubble and to consider others, um, then that helps to, um, it, 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 it develops a consciousness. And I think for me, um, when I knew at the age of 19 that I wanted to be a filmmaker, I had no idea that I would be making feature length, you know, impactful documentaries. That was something that unfolded and that I arrived at. Um, later uh, in my work history. But um, I think that increasingly the platform and the language of documentary and television is such a powerful tool for reaching people, for um, building bridges, for bringing people together and the hope and the goal with Meet the Future, which has already started because we've had a really big um, national Canadian release, um, is to really, um, because it's the only film in the whole world uh, yeah. that exists about the birth of this revolutionary um, big industry that is proliferating around the globe. Um, and so it's the only film about that and so this, the, 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 you know, the film has purpose and meaning, and it's really meant to um, be that tool to educate, to uh, foster and ignite um, dialogue and awareness um, and help move the help move the needle. Yeah, I love that because, you know, and I think you your mentality, the way that you approach such huge in issues that have such a wide impact, you know, building a bridge, you know, driving people, igniting people to make change is something that I really felt from Memphis meets as well. You know, that whole idea of the big tent mentality, you know, at, being inclusive. We want everybody to join us, making people feel like this is a realistic goal. You know, we're not fighting against you, you know, like, some of the companies like meat companies uh, aren't you Memphis meats doesn't see them as competitors, but instead like, how can we work together? And I really love that. The positive attitude feeling the nece the, you know, that it's necessary to bring people in instead of competing in a way that, well, we're going to end up on top you know, we're going to be number one. It's, it doesn't, it never felt like that. And I feel like that's such a huge, huge thing dealing with such huge topics. You know, you want people to feel included. Um, I, so another, actually, that kind of brings me to another question for David. I know you guys had uh, launched AMPS Innovation which again, just goes under the big tent mentality, bringing other companies, you know, with similar missions, similar objectives. How did you guys come to do that? And for anybody that's not uh, familiar with AMPS Innovation, it actually means the Alliance for Meat, Poultry and Seafood. But please, like how, how did that come about? Because that's not something that we saw in the film, but it still goes to show what Memphis Meats is. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, it, in the film, there's a lot of scenes that focus on the regulatory landscape for, for these products. 
um, uh, and that they will be jointly regulated by the USDA and the FDA. Um, and I think one of the really uh, unique characteristics of this industry, uh, and I think this is something Memphis Meats really started, again, it goes back to, to Uma and, and kind of his long-term vision from the beginning, was uh, a desire to make sure that unlike other innovative industries, um, this one was not trying to avoid regulation. I'm yeah. not seeing regulation as a nuisance or something to be ignored until, you know, there's no choice but to address it, but it's really something to embrace from the beginning. Uh, and I think that speaks to just our belief that food is so personal and uh, so important to consumers everywhere. And they want to know that their food is safe and that they can trust the food system that produced it. Um, and so from the beginning, we have really said, let's work as closely as we can with regulators and make sure that we are providing them with the information they need to make informed decisions about how to regulate our industry. And that is a view that I think the entire industry has really adopted. Um, and so this goes back to uh, AMPS Innovation, as you mentioned, Danielle, which is, you can think of it kind of as a precursor to a trade association for the industry. It's a coalition of now seven US-based cell cultured meat, poultry, and seafood companies. And we have banded together to try and work on the issues um, where we can find common ground on regulatory issues. Um, how can we work together to provide, again, the agencies that will be regulating us with the information they need um, to make informed decisions? Uh, and so I think, you know, it's very unusual for an industry to have this sort of formal coalition before they're even selling products. Amps Innovation launched in 2019 um, and no company was selling products anywhere in the world at that time. Uh, uh, but again, it speaks to how much we have really tried to bake regulatory considerations into our work from day one. Uh, and I think that's something that we are very proud of as a company and, and as an industry. Um, and we've been, I think, you know, Amps Innovation, again, speaking to this big tent notion that, that Memphis Meets um, really, really brought to the table. Uh, Amps Innovation recently signed a letter um, with the National Fisheries Institute, um, which is the first uh, regulatory collaboration between the, uh, our industry and the conventionally produced seafood industry. Prior to that, Amps Innovation had signed a letter with the North American Meat Institute which, um, as viewers will know, is a character in the film as Memphis Meets uh, signs a letter with NAMI um, earlier, which, which Liz captured. Um, and so I think AMPS Innovation has been an incredible platform for the industry to really make it clear that we care about food safety and regulation. We want to do this the right way and the responsible way. Uh, and we want to work with any stakeholders who are open to, to collaboration in this space. You know, that actually leads me to um, ask you about partnerships with bigger companies. I was very surprised to hear later in the film that companies like Tyson and Cargill were coming around to talk with Memphis Meats. I, that just seems insane to me because you, you would think uh, big dogs in the game like that would be like, nope, there are competition. We don't want you know, kind of how they, some of the farmers and, and whatnot didn't want you guys to have the ability to use meat in, in your product description. How has that been, that collaboration with, with companies like that? Was it a surprise? Did you guys approach them? Did they approach you? Yeah, I think it speaks to um, the extent to which, uh, I guess two things. One, again, goes back to this Big Ten notion of, of let's find something that everybody can get behind. Um, and two, I think there's an acknowledgement uh, throughout the food system that with demand growing as quickly as it is, there's just not enough resources on the planet to meet that demand unless there's additional methods of, of meat production. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not out to completely displace animal agriculture. We think that multiple meat production methods will have a role to play in meeting future demand for meat. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we were able to find that common ground with the folks you mentioned, Danielle Cargill and Tyson Foods, um, who, who are both investors in Memphis Meats, um, as well as the North American Meat Institute, which we mentioned earlier. 
um, which is, is not an investor, but who we worked with on, on some regulatory um, policy questions. Uh, and I think, again, it just speaks to this notion that everybody is out there looking for solutions to kind of bring this full circle back to the first question. Everybody wants solutions to the challenges our, our food system is facing. And we are willing to work with uh, anybody who is willing to come to the table in good faith and try to build uh, a better food system and a better world. I love that. I really hope you guys, I, I just love that embracing that mentality of the big tent. Everybody join us, you know, in good faith, let's have this conversation. And, you know, this is, this is huge. This is huge. And so I'd like to ask Liz, you know, you had mentioned it earlier. This is an exclusive film about this topic. Um, what would you tell any of our audience members tonight? Anybody that watches the film and even watches this later, uh, what would you tell them, audience members who may want to contribute to propelling this conversation, this idea forward? How can they support Memphis Meets and what Memphis Meets stands behind? What what can audience members do? It's a great question. I think uh, you know definitely if you Google the topic, um, you'll find a whole universe of new knowledge. And I would encourage everyone to immerse themselves into that universe because the protein revolution is underway and it is exploding. And that is so exciting. Like as a filmmaker, you know, back in 2016, starting to follow something that was so uncertain. And of course you never know where a story will go. You know, the startup Memphis Meets could have folded. It could have evaporated like so many startups do. Yeah. Um, but no, what happened was there was tremendous acceleration. And so the film charts the acceleration of this little tiny company into a, a leader in the field. And in that it charts Uma Valetti as a pioneer CEO. Yeah. You know, he, he, he lands the front cover of Inc. magazine as a pioneer, as a visionary. So what a gift as a filmmaker to be able to follow such a story. Well, now, so audiences, back to your question, Google all of this and learn, learn, learn. Follow Memphis Meets on, on all the, you know, social media platforms. Follow us because we've got big news coming soon about our international mm. release and nothing that we can announce just yet. Yep. But we, we need uh, people to use the film as, as a tool, as a vehicle for, you know, everyone should see this film. Most people yep. in the world eat meat, you know, mm. roughly 90% of the planet eats meat and meat consumption is actually on the rise. Um, in the world. And so it's a solution focused exclusive story. And, and yeah, just rally behind us, follow us, get involved, you know, in the conversation and the excitement around it. Yeah. And that it kind of goes back to you talking about your mom, your mom being an activist and being open to sharing that kind of passion with you. I feel like hmm. we need to have these conversations more often with our friends and our family, you know, and not to stigmatize being active and being engaged as this radical, crazy thing. Like we're allowed to be passionate about the earth and what we eat, you know, and where it comes from. Um, but and acti activism is not a dirty word. Yes. There, yes. There, you can be an activist at every tier of society yep. as, as a CEO, as a filmmaker, as a scientist, as a, you know, as a frontline worker, uh, it's every tier, it's every aspect, it, it's across political spectrums, it's everything. We need solutions, we need yeah. them urgently, and we need to, you know, work together to, um, you know, save Mother Earth, um, the billions and billions of animals that suffer tremendously, and yeah. human health. I mean, under yeah. this pandemic, this is, this is, you know, very scary, this, uh, you know, pandemic that we're living under. And so this is also a solution, you know, to the next health crisis. Yep, that's that's huge. 
Um, mm -hmm. And actually, before we go, I do want to take a question from the audience. So Jean would like to ask you, Liz, if you tasted the meat and what was your first impression? But, you know, like I said, I Googled you. I did some research, watched some interviews. You're a non-meat eater, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. So I'm assuming you didn't try it. No, I did. Oh, you did? So, oh, yeah. that's so surprising. And, and I love to talk about that because I had no, uh, so I'm an ethical vegan. Okay. And um, I just don't eat animals because I love them. And um, I'm also an environmentalist. So I, you know, don't support animal agriculture, but uh, I had no moral confusion or conflict in trying this meat whatsoever. And I enjoyed trying it twice over the course of three and a half years of following the story. It was fascinating. And I actually have a hoodie from Memphis Meats and a water bottle that says first bite. So oh. I'm, I'm part of that, you know, small group of people on the planet that has like, it's like going to the moon. Yeah. Like it's so forward thinking and innovative and amazing. I'm, I'm proud to have tried it. Yeah, I'm it was good. I'm so excited. You know, I I was afraid to ask you that because I was like, is that is it silly <laughs> to ask this? Like it's meat, but it's not meat. You it know, like where's that line? It's hundred percent meat. It's just completely a transformative way of how it gets to the plate. Yeah. I know without you, without the need to use and slaughter animals yep. and all the, you know, um cumbersome out of control sort of ways um, that we use resources and the and hurt and damage yeah. the ecosystem and biodiversity and yeah. all of that. So it eliminates so I, many of those things. So thank you, Jean, so much for asking that question. It took the heat off me a little bit. And I'm I'm so <laughs> excited that you know you were brave enough to try it and you loved it. Which, mm -hmm. you know, leads me, I hate, I hate we're you know, basically out of time. And I, I feel like I could talk to you guys all night, you know, just picking your brains and whatnot. But David, I would love to ask you. So in the film, at the very beginning, we learned that to produce one pound of meat, it costs $18,000. Now by the end of the film, so in like about 2019, when you guys were done filming with Memphis Meats, it was 2,400, I believe. Where are you guys at now? Yeah, so that I, I believe the twenty four hundred came from a scene in early twenty eighteen. Okay. Um, since then, the cost has gone down very dramatically. Um, you know, from from the time we were founded to today, we're talking multiple orders of magnitude. Um, and eventually, you know, we're we're not announcing um, cost uh, metrics uh, right now. Mm -hmm. um, but the goal eventually is to be uh, as affordable as conventionally produced meat and possibly even more affordable than conventionally produced meat. Um, and we think we can get there for the same reason we think we can be more resource efficient in terms of our, our natural resources and preserving the environment. Um, initially, the products will be at a price premium when we first come to market. Um, but the goal ultimately is to be accessible and to enable anybody around the world who wants it uh, a delicious and sustainable meat product. So that's the future that we're, we're charging towards at a hundred miles an hour. Yeah. I love that. I hope you guys get there. I'm so excited for it to hit the shelves. I'm so excited to try it. And that, you know, my last question for you guys, of course, this is revolutionary. This, this promise to change the world's agriculture as we know it. So Liz, you spent three years with Memphis Meats. Will there be any kind of follow-up? Um, probably not, but uh, we do have some exciting news about uh, the international release of the film coming soon and also a campaign associated with it and a campaign associated with the distribution and release of a film is an exciting way to include very current, up to date. Um, I mean, it, the film itself yeah. is timeless. Yeah. But you can also, through a campaign, um, leverage um, you know news as it unfolds. Oh, and yeah. like I'm like I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, this industry is is on like acceleration mode. 
So there's startups that have popped up all over the globe since we started filming. Yeah. And and that's really exciting. So it's an opportunity to leverage, you know, all of the news and how it's how it's uh, evolving weekly. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. we're definitely going to stay tuned for that and we look forward to your next projects to come. And of course, I know myself amongst others, many others will be following Memphis Meets to see what you guys you guys have in store for us in the future. Wishing you you both all the best. I'm so thankful you were you were able to join us tonight. Thank you so much for sharing this film with us. I'm so happy the timing just seemed to work out so great for you, Liz, and Memphis Meets and following Dr. Uma. David, thank you so much. Please pass all of our positive vibes, positive energy to Memphis Meets. We're really hoping for this to to keep going. Wow, amazing. Thanks, Danny. Yes, Wonder, thank wonderful, you. wonderful Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, was, thank you so much. Yes, it was great to have you guys both. Thank you. Bye, David. Bye, Liz. Bye, everyone. <laughs> and now we're going to kick it back to Allie and we're going to get started for our next segment. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting, actually. Christy Cooper, the director of our next film, who's going to be featured in this next segment, uh, left a little private comment for us in the chat. She said, everyone, we are in the presence of a filmmaking genius, Liz Marshall. And apparently they are films. We're so sorry we couldn't connect them on screen. But um, hopefully in passing, you guys send good vibes and you're able to connect soon. So, Allie, it's back to you. Thanks, Daniel. And a special thanks to Karen Schiller from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who will be interpreting for us for the rest of the evening. Thank you, Karen. We want to take a moment as we transition into the second half of tonight's happy hour to thank our special guests and our audience for raising a glass with us. Tonight, in my case, it is a can of Crushworthy Great Lakes Brewing Company beer. We wouldn't be here without your ongoing support to bring film home. Please consider making a contribution to our challenge match to support the future of our festival. This year, our goal is to reach $145,000, and we are so grateful for any amount that you're able to give and for those who already have. To donate, please visit clevelandfilm.org forward slash donate. Now we'll head into tonight's second segment, which is going to be led by Dan Brown, co-founder of Rust Belt Writers. Welcome, Dan. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about the conversation to be had. Um, I uh, am a step ahead. I've already got my my Great Lakes Dortmunder with me, uh, and I'm really excited to introduce um, some of my special guests from Youth v. Gov. Um, I'd first like to welcome and introduce the director, Chrissy Cooper. Um, Welcome, Chrissy. Hey, Daniel. Uh, and then Philip Gregory, who's the co-lead counsel in the case Juliana v. United States. How are you, Philip? Hi, Daniel. Thank you for having me, and thanks for to the Cleveland Film Festival for showing this amazing film. Absolutely. And then we got Alex uh, Loznak, one of the youth plaintiffs of, in the case. Hello. Thank you, Daniel. Good to be here virtually. Yeah. Absolutely. We're excited to have you. And then Jacob LaBelle, who's another youth plaintiff uh, in the case of Juliana v. United States in the amazing film Youth v. Gov. So um, we got you, Jacob. Awesome. Um, so I wanted to start off with a sort of broader question of uh, we've got an attorney, we have uh, some amazing young people, and we've got a director. Um, I'd be curious to hear how you all came to uh, intersect with one another. Uh, and I'd first like to talk, ask that to Chrissy, right? Um, this this film uh, spanned many years, lots of geography, and I'm curious how you as a filmmaker came to uh, find the story uh, and become involved in the ongoing case that was unfolding. Sure. So my my journey with the story actually started way back in 2011. Um, I worked on a series of 10 short films called Stories of Trust, and they featured young people who were suing their state governments in contrast to what Jacob and Alex are doing is suing the federal government. 
Um, so, so these young people were also um, supported by the nonprofit organization um, that is uh, running Julia, the Juliana case, um, Our Children's Trust. And the 10 short films that we did were about these, these young plaintiffs and the, the climate impacts that they were experiencing in their own states. And two, well, actually three of those plaintiffs are now on the Juliana case. Shita Scott Martinez from Colorado, Kelsey Juliana, who's the, the named plaintiff in this case, and Jamie Lynn Butler from Arizona. Um, so that was kind of my, my introduction, first of all, of just working with young people and telling young people's stories and being introduced to climate litigation and how the judicial branch can be used as one means of our branch of government of, you know, uh, um, uh, as a solution for addressing the climate crisis. And so I was kind of already, you know, in the story and embedded with some of the people that are, are intimately associated with the story. So in 2015, when these young people filed this new lawsuit, um, I was, you know, watching with anticipation to see what was going to happen. And when they had first win in the spring of 2016 with Judge Coffin, that was kind of the moment where I just dropped everything that I was doing and said, this is like, this is it. This is the story I need to be working on. And I really, truly believed at that point that this case was, was going to go somewhere. That's awesome. And then Phil, I wanted to turn to you, right? Um, what was your background that led you to being one of the lead co-counsels for this case? Um, and and what what in your life led you to to be become involved in this uh, this super important case? So I uh, was a trial attorney uh, doing complex business and uh, environmental litigation for many years. And in 2010, I started working with Julia Olson on climate litigation. Now, fast forward to 2018, after we'd filed Juliana and we had our first round in the Ninth Circuit, um, my grandchildren started to be, be born. In fact, um, here's a picture of my granddaughter Alice with Kelsey Juliana. And you know, at, at some point, Daniel, uh, uh, people uh, who are younger than Jacob and Alex are going to be looking me in the eye like my grandchildren, uh, Alice and Lincoln, are going to be looking me in the eye and say, Papa, what did you do during the climate wars? And I want to be able to say I did everything. I gave up my uh, 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 commercial litigation career to take on the federal government to work with these uh, uh, youth who are suing the biggest organization in the world and uh, that we're going to prevail because uh, both Jacob and Alex, as well as the other 19 plaintiffs, uh, are remarkable individuals, and their message is being put out by an incredible director, Christy. So I'll turn it over to Jacob or Alex. Yeah, I'd love to hear how you got involved, um, as well as both, like, where were you at that stage in your life? And talk talk about where you are now and how your involvement in this in this case has either uh, affirmed your your path in life or helped invigorate sort of where you are today. Um, if we want to start with Alex, I, that sounds great. And then we'd love to hear from you, Jacob, too. Sure. Well, my path in life has been a little crazy, I will say. Uh, I'm actually a first-year law student currently. I decided we've got a, a, a terrible pandemic, and there's nothing better to do than get a uh, first year of law school out of the way. So that is definitely, I uh, added another uh, layer uh, to my understanding of the case and, and my activism. But if we rewind a little bit, uh, I guess you could call me uh, the OC. In other words, the original, uh, or the OCA, the original climate activist, uh, because uh, before this, you know, youth climate movement had really risen and become as prominent uh, as it was, even back when I was uh, in high school uh, in the mid 2010s, I was talking about this issue. I formed a uh, club at, in high school to try and get uh, solar panels installed at the school. Um, and when I found out uh, that this case was going to be filed, uh, I was very excited to join the case um, because uh, I had been concerned for many years uh, at that point about uh, the real lack of leadership at the federal level um, in dealing with climate change. 
uh, and energy policy. And one area where that has really touched my life, and I hope we can get a little bit deeper into this, both with uh, the conversation with me and uh, Jacob, uh, is uh, in the context of this Pacific Connector natural gas pipeline that w is uh, uh, the this Canadian natural gas company has been trying to force through uh, our home community in Southern Oregon uh, for uh, about a decade and a half now. Um, and uh, that pipeline uh, was and continues to be a part of this case. It's just one example of the type of fossil fuel infrastructure uh, that the federal government uh, has and continues to, and hopefully will not continue to, uh, rubber stamp despite the uh, really severe deleterious impacts of that type of infrastructure and fossil fuel production and consumption on the climate. That's great. And we're definitely going to get back to uh, the approach on tactics, as well as what current times mean for the, the case as it unfolds. But Jacob, I'd love for you to speak more to how you got involved, um, what life was like before this case, and what your life is like now. Yep. Um, well, I actually got involved um, when Alex uh, messaged me on Facebook uh, out of the blue. <laughs> so it turns out that uh, we had a childhood friend in, in common. Uh, I never met Alex before, uh, but I got this message from, uh, from this guy on Facebook. And I think we took screenshots of that original conversation. Um, turn, turned out to change, I think, both our lives uh, pretty dramatically, uh, mine especially. And uh, the reason Alex reached out to me was, uh, as you just heard, the Pacific Connector Pipeline. Um, so we live about an hour from each other. We're both from um, family farms. Um, so we both live on rural family farms. Um, you can see some of that in the, in the film. And uh, we were both being touched by this uh, proposed project, which was being permitted uh, ultimately by um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, which is part of the federal government. And its, it's appointees are appointed by, uh, by the president and the administration that's in power. Uh, whenever um, that administration is in power, they appoint these commissioners that then have the power to um, decide whether this pipeline is going to go, uh, you know, in my case, on my neighbor's property very close to my farm um, and through all the major rivers and watersheds of Oregon. And it would also have been the biggest um, carbon um, emission producer in the state of Oregon. And so um, that was kind of my introduction to, um, to both the Juliana case. Um, Alex heard that I was involved in fighting this pipeline and that's why he reached out to me. And then uh, I think without maybe fully understanding where this whole journey was gonna take me, um, <laughs> I decided to, <laughs> to sign on to this case. Um, suing the U.S. federal government, um, not just against this pipeline project, but against their um, cumulative um, actions, um, permitting and subsidizing and creating um, these fossil fuel projects and this fossil fuel infrastructure for the last 60 plus years, um, thus uh, creating and driving climate change that, that's um, irreparably uh, damaging and changing our lives as young people. Um, and so it kind of just became not just a local issue for me, obviously, but kind of a national and global issue. Um, so that was my introduction. And uh, before that, I would say, contrary a little bit to Alex, uh, though we have very similar backgrounds, I didn't really consider myself like an activist, um, you know, attending rallies and, and getting involved in politics. Um, I moved from Quebec, Canada when I was four with my family, we became US citizens and we moved to Oregon to start a farm. Um, and kind of my, my father and my family were kind of part of the back to the land movement. Um, and we were trying to kind of um, understand what needs to be done because we had a feeling as a lot of other people I think did and still do that there's serious issues with how where we're heading as a civilization especially in our relationship with nature um, and in, to the point where we're now irreparably damaging our climate for, you know, the, the next hundreds and thousands of years. So this for me is the kind of definitive issue, defining issue of, of my life. And so it was kind of an extension when this case came up. I'd grown all my life on a farm trying to live embody these sustainable values. I think you can see some of, of where I live and some footage of that in the movie. Um, and so the, the case felt like a natural extension of my life um, and my goals and intentions. 
Um, but it was definitely a big step up <laughs> and it's definitely been an amazing ride. Um, and, and the movie, I got to say, uh, has been probably one of the, the biggest highlights. Um, working with Christy and watching the movie has, has been, you know, I think one of the really uh, great highlights of this journey. Yeah. Another, no, another I mean, way I, of, oh, I, I was just going to say, no, sorry, go ahead. No, go for it. Alex. I was just going to say, uh, another way of putting it is, you know, Jacob, here Jacob was just sort of living his idyllic farm life. And then I came along and corrupted <laughs> him and sort of brought him into the activism sphere. Uh, and his life has never quite been the same, but we're very glad. <laughs> So basically, I was Bilbo and he was Gandalf. <laughs> That's great. I also was really taken by just the sense of camaraderie I found amongst the plaintiffs and just, well, well, every they're all young, you know, youth or the young people. There was a there was such a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives brought uh, and and made visible in the film. I'm curious, what what did you learn about yourself or learn about uh, different parts of the country, for example? through this this lawsuit and and to what degree did it shape sort of your approach to to activism um and and just really a better understanding the scope of the impact that this lawsuit uh seeks to make corrective action for well that's a great question i i suppose uh i can start with it uh you know uh jacob and i i don't have completely identical life stories, but we did both grow up in, you know, in rural Southern Oregon. Um, and going from that background to, you know, being sort of thrust into this uh, global media spotlight has been uh, a very interesting and unique experience. Uh, you know, I uh, debating some of the world's finest law professors on the merits of the case and that sort of thing. This is not this, this is not what I would have necessarily thought I would have been doing, uh, you know, when I was uh, a teenager, just living on the farm, going to high school, uh, taking the SAT. Uh, and this case certainly has, uh, for me, I uh, kindled, you know, a passion for law. Uh, and we'll see what exactly I do in the in the long run. Uh, but I think. Absolutely, we, we should be thinking about uh, climate change as a uh, legal problem, um, and we need to get the right laws uh, on the books, both through litigation, legislation, etc., to really address um, this problem. And I think that this case uh, really is a very creative and powerful way uh, to try and move in that direction. Jacob, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that, um, you know, meeting the plaintiffs from all around the United States. Um, I, I still remember very vividly the first day that we met because because we, you know, I'd met Alex and I think that was it actually, even of the Oregon plaintiffs that were closer to me. Um, so I personally kind of met everyone, basically all 21 of us met for the first time in this house in Eugene, Oregon. And, you know, there was Shadesca Martinez, who was already basically this world, you know, celebrity. And there was, you know, Levi, eight year old, you know, kid with a lot of energy from Florida. Uh, and there was just this very wide kind of range. There was Nathan from Alaska and Journey from Hawaii. And <laughs> there was just, there was a, you know, we really represent, um, you know, all the different corners of the United States um, and a lot of different cultures and backgrounds. You know, I'm from Quebec originally, <laughs> so I grew up here, but there's kind of a very diverse group. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things really that I learned from them um, is, you know, I think first of all, too, in, in relation to the movie is the climate impacts that that we're all facing, which are very different, but all stem from climate change. And so I think even for me, you know, I, I hope that for the people who are watching the movie and, and hearing about us on the media, that they're being educated on how climate change impacts their lives, um, you know, whether that's through wildfire or smoke or drought or increased heat waves or flooding but even for me it was an education i was already aware of climate change obviously and environmental issues but to actually meet levi you know who who's been experiencing hurricanes firsthand who you know his home is projected to be underwater in the next 30 years um you know to to like meet and befriend Jaden and become pretty close and then like a year later that her house is flooded 
and that two days later or something, you know, the next week after we're in court and, and we're bringing her story before a judge, uh, that kind of drove home for me, I think, even for me who was already familiar with those issues, those stories, you know, of these people who'd become my friends um, and a little bit like siblings, I think, in, in many ways, um, kind of really educated and, and I think raised my engagement, um, even as someone who was already very concerned with those issues. Um, so I think that's, that's something that I learned that changed me, obviously, on a personal level, um, just kind of attending all these events and being part of, of, of this journey um, with, with all the plaintiffs. Uh, really change, I think, every single one of us. And we're a little bit like um, siblings, like I said, at this point. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Daniel, so, so my, go, go ahead, Christy. Go ahead, go ahead, Christy. Yeah, I was just going to say that, I, you know, your observation of the, the diversity of these, um, of these young people in the story really, really brings home the point of that climate change is impacting all of us and no one is immune from that experience and from that impact. And I think one of the really beautiful things that I learned from working with these people, you know, over the last 10 years is they have taught me, um, I, they have taught me so much about the intersectionality of, of climate justice and how, you know, climate really, is a it's a racial justice issue it's an environmental justice issue it's a there there's so many components it's an economic justice issue education justice issue and and i have learned that through these young people and that's been a really incredible experience and journey for me and daniel um well christy's job does an excellent uh, christy's movie does an excellent job depicting this i want to make the point that i've been practicing law for over 40 years and these plaintiffs are the best clients I've ever had. They all attended all these hearings where that included them flying in from all over the country. They sat for uh, uh, examinations by uh, seasoned Department of Justice attorneys. They got ready to go to trial. Uh, um, they even learned how to tie a tie. It's it, it, they really they really were amazing individuals. They weren't sitting at home. Uh, uh, playing video games or, or, or going out and doing other things that you would typically do as I certainly did as a teenager. What they were out doing is they were attending the rallies, uh, uh, getting ready to testify at trial. The stuff that, that is difficult to do at, at any age, let alone when you're a teenager or younger, For in Levi's case, for example, but they did it and they were uh, remarkable at doing it. And I think that's that's a great segue into what I'm sure most viewers of the film are curious about, right? What what's the update? Where where do we stand with the case? Um, and then to to build on that, we also got a question from the audience from Martin uh, asking about uh, we've got the Paris Climate Accord that we left and now are rejoining. There's talks of a Green New Deal. Um, how do you weigh that? Those type of uh, macro and micro political uh, policy approaches uh, in relationship to the the lawsuit. Um, so first, I'd love any update on the lawsuit, and then any reflections you have on what the current administration means for uh, progress or stagnation, and and where does the fight lead us now? So, uh, in terms of an update on the lawsuit, it's three fronts. First, as uh, we all know, we've got a horrible decision out of the Ninth Circuit uh, that said. Uh, um, Despite the fact that youth uh, uh, are injured, the federal government's actions are injuring the youth, that these youth do not have the ability to get into court to uh, um, put their constitutional rights on in a science-based trial. And the Ninth Circuit uh, denied us an en banc hearing. So route one would be to go to the United States Supreme Court by filing a petition uh, for a writ of certiorari. And that uh, deadline for doing that is in July of this year, July 2021. The second uh, uh, avenue is on March 9, we filed a motion to amend our complaint before our district court judge, Ann Aiken, in Eugene uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, April 13. 
that motion will be briefed and she will then decide whether or not our case proceeds in the district court. Hopefully we'll get a decision around uh, April 22, Earth Day, and we know uh, that we're gonna be proceeding to trial in court. But the third avenue, and uh, I'm gonna have uh, Jacob and, and Alex build on this, is uh, the, uh, we're hoping to have the opportunity with the Biden administration to sit down at the table and get them to adopt a different stance to this case than did the prior administrations. Remember, we sued Obama. We, uh, when he took office, we sued the president after Obama. And right now we're suing Biden. And what we'd like to do is sit down with them and, and work on a resolution that will be based on these youth and future generations having their rights protected and for the federal government to stop doing what uh, 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 the acts that are causing the harm. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob or Alex. Sure. Well, I, there's there's a lot to say uh, here, uh, but I'll just start by saying, uh, with regard to the uh, uh, petition to amend the case or the motion to amend the case, uh, I am quite bullish on that uh, motion, and not just. Uh, because I have a dog in the fight and I'm a little bit uh, biased here, uh, but also uh, because as a uh, law student, I think the law is pretty firmly on our side. Uh, now, we should keep in mind that uh, the uh, district judge, the U.S. District Judge Ann Aiken in Eugene, uh, has ruled in our favor before. She ruled not to dismiss the case, and she wanted to take this case to trial uh, she set a trial date multiple times, uh, and if it were not for uh, the courts of appeal, including the Ninth Circuit and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, intervening, uh, she would have held that trial. And she she made she has made that very clear that she did not want this case to go up on appeal before a trial, uh, as it in fact did. Uh, but that she thought the appropriate uh, pathway would be to, to hold a trial to review the evidence, to review the science of climate change. Uh, and to uh, determine whether there is a violation of constitutional rights in light of the science. Um, and I, I'm pretty confident that if she had that opportunity, she would uh, find that constitutional rights are in fact being violated uh, because the science shows just how grave uh, the impacts of climate change really are. Um, so, you know, if that motion is granted, uh, then this case stands in a very mm -hmm. strong position uh, to be able to go to trial. Uh, and I, I, I want to note just as well, the ordinary pathway, uh, the ordinary procedural pathway that a case goes through, I know this is happy hour, so maybe civil procedure is a little bit too dry of a topic for folks, but the, the ordinary procedural pathway for a case is you file the case, mm -hmm. and uh, if it's not dismissed, I... Uh, Ordinarily, it goes to trial, and there's a few other things. There's a the motion for summary judgment, etc. But ordinarily, uh, the appeal does not happen until after uh, the trial. Uh, and what happened in this case is that the Trump era DOJ uh, used this archaic um, uh, tool called a petition for writ of mandamus, which is essentially something that they resurrected from beyond the grave. This is this is a uh, tactic that. I uh, know is essentially extinct uh, in the U.S. court systems uh, to try and take this up to the Supreme Court prior to going to trial. Uh, and my hope would be uh, that the uh, the new DOJ under uh, former Judge Merrick Garland would not try and use these e extreme and archaic tactics to try and avoid uh, facing a fair trial. Uh, so. My hope would be uh, that Judge Aiken will grant this motion. I think there's a very good chance of it, uh, and then take this case to trial as she wanted to do in the first place. Now, I also would uh, highlight, as Phil pointed out, uh, at any point here, whether it be prior to trial, whether it be after trial, uh, whether it be uh, during a uh, appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, the Biden administration can and should come to the table uh, and 
nego negotiate a settlement agreement for this case. Uh, it's well within their, their authority to do that. In fact, most mm -hmm. cases uh, don't go to trial, not necessarily because they're dismissed, but actually because they're settled out of court. And so that is absolutely a possibility. Uh, and there's a wide range of options that uh, and uh, things that the government could agree to do through a settlement. Uh, and they include uh, decarbonizing the U.S. energy system and putting in place, you know, concrete policies to move us off of fossil fuels. And that that is a very real uh, possibility. So I, I think there are some very positive pathways here that we could uh, follow. I just wanted to um, also emphasize for those for those watching this motion to amend the complaint that the plaintiffs filed on March 9th. What's what's what to just give that a little bit of context. So the Ninth Circuit Court got hung up on being able to provide the the injunctive relief, which was uh, mandating that the government uh, enact climate recovery plans. They totally agreed that the plaintiffs' constitutional rights are violated and that they've been violated by the government. Um, so what the, the plaintiffs are now trying to put the emphasis on with this amending their complaint is the declaratory part of the relief that they're asking. They're asking for the courts to simply state what the law is and that these young people have a constitutional right to a stable climate system. And it's very similar to what happened in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. The very first decision was a declaratory relief. And not until the following year was there actually actually um, regulations put into place to, to desegregate. So this is a really important piece of this case for the courts to actually simply declare the law as it states. And so they're, they're, because the Ninth Circuit Court got hung up on the climate recovery plans, the plaintiffs are kind of trying to simplify this a little bit. So just for the audience to understand, this is a really big this is a really hopeful thing for the case, and I think there's a, a lot of hope that this could really, you know, bring the case back to trial. And if I if I can add really briefly on, on that, um, for me, it's always been a huge um, point of mind that trial um, is extremely important, and I think that's kind of something that we all we all think, and it should be. It's it's kind of like Alex said, the way that a case should normally progress. And, you know, if you enjoyed the movie, imagine, you know, multiple weeks <laughs> of, of video and live testimony, uh, you know, stories from all the 21 plaintiffs, um, you know, testimonies from dozens of the leading experts in wildfires, in forestry, in ocean acidification, in, in climate science, in, in historical, you know, narratives and historical actions by political actors in the last 60 years all kind of presented to the American public and to the global public um, in a court of law where, you know, like we like to say facts are facts and climate denial is perjury, <laughs> like Julia likes to say. Um, and so, you know, this would be a really powerful thing. Um, and we're really fighting for that. And we're really hopeful that this uh, motion to amend uh, will allow us to get to that trial. And we really think it should. Um, the second point is that um, the, the Biden administration, I think, really has a lot of interest in um, coming to the settlement table with us. Maybe one point that's not uh, been made completely clear is that um, a settlement uh, would uh, potentially and hopefully would um, be binding, legally binding throughout future administrations. Um, so should the presidency, the presidency will ultimately, you know, after four or eight years, go to another um, another uh, politician holding that seat. But we will be settling with the office of the president, not necessarily with a particular person who's holding that office. And so a settlement could potentially be binding across administrations, which is what we need. And it's also why, uh, touching on that question from Martin the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which is, you know, I, I, I love it. I'm glad that we're joining it again. Uh, but look, having Trump in office just pointed out how flimsy uh, agreements like this are, where we can just leave and come back in and not really do much progress at all. Um, you know, and so it, it can become, and I think in the past, it has become a kind of a veneer 
um, and something to hide behind, uh, for governments to hide behind while nothing is being done to actually protect the rights of their citizens. And so look, the Paris Climate Agreement is not legally binding. Um, it does not legally protect the right of U.S. citizens and especially of young people who can't vote. I can vote. Alex can vote. But there are, you know, most of the plaintiffs in this case cannot vote. They have no uh, say and no power in terms of, you know, um, political power in our, our government. Um, and so part of what this case is about is, look, these young people and the children of this nation will be impacted drastically by the decisions that are being made by, you know, Obama and Trump that were made by Obama and Trump and now Biden. And they should have a voice and the best way for them to have that voice and to be protected is for the courts to provide that protection. Um, as historically we've seen with um, a lot of cases, including Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of an important point in terms of, of the Paris Climate Agreement. Yeah, and so so building on that, a a reflection I had in watching the movie was was really in um, just the, this idea of a diversity of tactics, right? Th this is a massively intersectional issue. Um, the allusions to Brown versus Board of Education uh, linked to the Montgomery bus boycotts, you know. And so I'm curious whether it be elections, uh, what we what we might want to be doing in the midterm, uh, obviously getting Biden into office represented a change in policy. Um, but similarly, in our daily lives, we we have uh, we have decisions that we can make, and those all are informed and roll up into into broader policy. And so, um, so while individual actions are important, um, there are major actors that that play a significant role. And so, I'm wondering if if you could talk, and you you've hit on this in many ways, but I, I'm curious how. Uh, for someone who wants to get involved, right? For someone who is is supportive of your case, um, there there are things we can do in our daily lives. There are politicians we might uh, support, policies we can advocate on behalf of. I'm just curious, you know, for for someone who doesn't have either the overly onerous privilege or burden of being a plaintiff, um, or a, or a talent of a filmmaker or a law degree, how does one uh, begin to uh, support these kinds of systemic changes rather than um, the the sort of more incrementalism that uh, we might see often touted about? Well, the first thing that, that comes to mind for me is call on President Biden to reverse uh, the position of the U.S. government on Juliana v. United States, which is something that is absolutely within his power to do and within the power of the attorney general uh, to do. I remember when, when Obama was in office, there used to be this uh, government uh, petition platform where if you got you know 100,000 signatures or something like that, they had to uh, respond to it. And I think it would be great if, there were, if we could do something like that uh, for Juliana and really get, you know, force uh, Biden himself to answer in some way, give some kind of response. Here's what my position is. Uh, here's what I think, you know, the Department of Justice should do uh, to deal with this case, you know, and talk to your senators, talk to your member of Congress, uh, because they can put that pressure on uh, the, the executive branch and the, the Department of Justice as well. Daniel, I, I would also say that, you know, I think history has shown us that movements like this um, are, are multifold. Um, you, you know, the... Uh, I was on a panel a few weeks ago with Reverend Yearwood, and he said he said something really interesting. He said, uh, "Demonstrations without litigation, or sorry, he said, um, oh, I'm, demonstrations without litigation and um, legislation lead to frustration." And I think that's I think that's really true. We need, you know, as, as you said, not everybody can be a plaintiff on a lawsuit against the United States, but that doesn't mean that that all of these actions that people take don't matter. 
And I think it's really important that we continue to be in the streets and to yeah, have our voices heard. It's really important that we do have these climate litigations such as the Juliana case that are that are moving forward in the courts. And it's also really important that we continue to push our legislature, legislators and the, the people who are making the rules of our of our land and, and what that means. And I think that's that's very empowering to people to know that all of these things collectively as a whole can make a difference. And you know, I think this film more than anything shows that holding our government ap accountable is, is, is incredibly important. And government can take many shapes and forms from your school board to your, you know, to your school, to your county and city um, commissioners, to your state representatives, to the, to the federal government. So these are all, these are all levels that people can plug in in holding holding their leaders accountable on the climate crisis and, and asking them to stand up for their future. And to build on what Chrissy just said, give me one second. It's holding them accountable to take actions. Don't mm -hmm. hold them accountable if they're going to write a report or have a committee meeting. No, they've got to shut down uh, uh, leasing uh, of uh, uh, for fossil fuels on federal lands. They've got to be actually doing something. Because I know the uh, plaintiffs I represent and their uh, other youth, they don't want to hear words. They want actions. They want this Biden administration to talk with its feet. And it hasn't done it yet because it's still doing, there's still bad stuff coming out of federal lands. And that needs to get shut down right now. If you read the science reports, if you're the people watch this movie, understand the science. And I'm not talking about some scientists uh, uh, on, on the fringe. I'm talking about reading the government reports, which I have, which Christie has, which these plaintiffs have. The, the federal government is the worst actor in history on uh, creating this climate crisis, and it has to urgently take steps to, uh, uh, to deal with this climate crisis. And as Christie correctly said, and has a, the big theme of his mo this movie is, our youth are holding the government accountable and geezers like me need to step up and stand with the youth to make sure that the government's held accountable or throw the bums out of office again and put people in who'll actually do the job. Absolutely. And I think that the, the movie Youth v. Gov did an excellent job capturing that. Uh, it was thought provoking, inspiring, motivating. I might go to law school now. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I just want to sincerely, on behalf of uh, the Cleveland International Film Festival, thank each and every one of you for um, all that you're doing, uh, advocating for us and future generations for the amazing film that you made, Christy. Um, uh, we're just so lucky to be been able to take it in and, and reflect on it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dan Daniel. We feel really honored to be a part of the Cleveland International Film Festival community. So thank you very much. Awesome. Um, so with that being said, I think we're going to wrap up tonight's happy hour. Again, we want to thank our sponsor, Great Lakes Brewing Company, um, for you know uh, helping us out on another happy hour. Um, I want to also invite people to tune in tomorrow night at 8 uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time for another uh, uh, SIF happy hour. So uh, in the meantime, please stay, stay safe, uh, enjoy the nice weather that we hopefully have, and stay tuned to all the ongoing developments in this case uh, and others. So thanks so much and have a great evening. Thank you.